Good morning, Grace Church. Good morning. Our series right now is called Second to None, and it's a series all about Jesus. Again, if you know me at all, I really kind of get hype about Jesus. I get very excited. I get, I get thrilled to talk about him because of the impact on me personally that knowing Jesus has made. I'm a wholly different creature this side of knowing Jesus, but also because I've seen the impact that Jesus has on others, okay? I've seen it in you and the lives of, of those in this room right now, but throughout my life, I have known people who were not so wonderful human beings who on the other side of encountering Jesus and following Jesus, they are remarkable human beings because Jesus was the only one who was ever perfectly human. He was all that humanity was intended to be. And as we follow him, as we center our lives on Jesus, we are able to be more fully human, more the way God designed us to be. So we're taking this uh, series of weeks to talk about Jesus. And we're focusing on the book of Colossians. This is a letter that was written to early believers in the first century world. Uh, the apostle Paul is writing to them that even though he does, doesn't necessarily know them face to face, he is uh, engaged with them and he has things he wants to share. And in looking into what's, what is Colossians all about? trying to check in with some other thinkers in the area. And there's a, a gentleman named uh, Simon Turpin. He's actually the executive director for the uh, UK and Europe branch of an organization called Answers in Genesis. And he wrote about Colossians and he said this, God's people, in, in the context of Colossians, God's people have often fallen into tragedy because they have forgotten who he is and what he has done for them. Paul reminded the Colossians who Jesus is and what he accomplished in his death and resurrection. When we truly understand that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, the creator of all things, the head of the church and has reconciled all things, then we will not be deluded by erroneous arguments and philosophy. This does not mean that, oh, oh, oh if you believe in Jesus, you better make sure you don't ask questions, okay? If you're going to believe in Jesus, you check your brain at the door and you just do as you're... That is not what Colossians communicates. That is not what, what God calls to us. That's not what I'm telling you. In fact, quite the contrary. But the fact of the matter is, if we as Christians put our hope and our confidence of our faith in anything other than Jesus, we will be swept away by the currents and the, the streams of this world. Our center must be on Jesus, not just on this idea of Jesus, but quite literally knowing him, relationally connected to him. Knowing Jesus has to be the foundation for us. If we do that, then all the philosophies, all the arguments, all the things that might otherwise trip us up or confuse us will not undo us. We can, we can stand in light of them because Jesus answers every argument. See, John, the book of John, the Apostle John tells us uh, that Jesus himself said, I am the way and the truth and the life. See, Jesus is truth. Jesus answers every question. And so that's why we're digging into here. And that's what uh, uh, Simon Turpin here was saying, that at its core, Colossians, the book of Colossians is pointing God's people back to understand who Jesus is and the fact that he is in all things sufficient, and he is in all things what we talked about our first week here in Colossians, preeminent of the highest order, first place. So we're going to start digging, and we're going to dig right into the text. We're going to try to move through it, because um, there's a lot to get through here. As we've said, said before, what we're doing is we're asking our life groups or other small groups that are getting together to really dig in to some of the content from Colossians that we don't cover here on Sunday mornings because there's too much. I could take the rest of 2024 every Sunday and preach on Colossians and not, not hit everything. There's just so much in there. 
So what we're doing is we're equipping our small group leaders with guides that have tons of questions and can help guide that discussion. So if you feel like we're kind of glossing over some parts, that's okay. Connect in with one of these groups, be happy to help you do that because during the week, they'll help flesh out some more of the, the content in here, but we're trying to get kind of some big picture ideas about who Jesus is, what he's done, and why he is sufficient, why he is preeminent. So if you've got your Bibles, open to the book of Colossians. It's in your New Testament, kind of about midpoint there. It's after the, the, the gospel accounts at the beginning. And we're going to be in chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 6 of chapter 2. And here's what we read. Therefore, in light of what we talked about last week when it comes to walking worthy, walking worthy of who Jesus is, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. I want to just dig into a couple words here. We're not going to do this for, for, for every verse, but this verse kind of sets the, the stage for the rest of what we're talking about tonight. And there's some, there's some rich meaning in these words that we don't necessarily capture in our English translations. If you weren't familiar, the Bible did not drop out of heaven in English. That's, that's not how it worked. I know it's a shock to some of you. But no, it was actually written originally uh, in two primary languages. In the Old Testament, it's primarily what, church? Hebrew. Hebrew. And in the New Testament, it's primarily what? Greek. Greek. So Greek, uh, Greek New Testament, Hebrew Old Testament. We are in the New Testament. That's where Colossians is. So this is prim originally written in Greek. And when you get to the original language, sometimes it carries meaning that Otherwise, you might miss, you know, the, the phrase lost in translation. And there's some neat things that are in here. So the first phrase kind of want to look at is this idea of receiving Christ. So Paul's writing to, to these early Christians, and he, he says, you know, you're supposed, here's Jesus. He's preeminent. Because he's preeminent, you should walk worthy. And he's saying, now, in light of that, therefore, as you have received. Now, this word received is an interesting one. And um, here, I'll give you a little graphic. This kind of shows how this word, this original word, it's uh, para, paralambano, paralambano. And it, it's used in several places. I think it's about 46 times in the New Testament. And we translate it here as received, but at its core, it has more a meaning of taking. Meaning it's not just, oh, yes, I got that. Like, um, I got a telephone call. Oh, I received a call. It's more the idea that I've, something has been transferred to me and I'm taking it with me. It's used in some places of like shepherds with their sheep in that they, um, when they found a sheep, they took it with them. So it's not just they received the sheep, but literally the sheep went with the shepherd. So if we get back here, this paralambano is received, the paralambano Christ. We've received Christ. We are taking Christ with us. Remember what we said last week? That we need to walk in a manner worthy of Christ. We need to reflect him. We need, as we go through this life, if we're going to live like Jesus is enough, we're going to live like Jesus is preeminent, like he is supreme. Walking worthy of him means we take him with us. He's not somebody that we just talk about at church and see some big bearded guy on stage hop around and get excited about. We take Jesus with us. He is a companion on the journey. And then he keeps going and he says that as we receive Christ Jesus the Lord, we are again to walk in him, abide. And here, here's the neat one. It was paralambano was the word for receive. There's a little kind of word play here in the Greek. It's paralambano to take. It's parapateo to conduct or to live. So it's this kind of, he was creating a pithy saying. It was take and walk. Paralambano, parapateo. Parapalambo, parapateo. It was this idea that it was a little phrase that they could get in their heads, these early, these early Christians, and know, I take and I walk. I take Jesus with me. I walk with Jesus. Not just in theory, not just in concept, but he is literally with me in a way that defies explanation. That we are to conduct ourselves as if we are walking Jesus uh, arm in arm through life. And then verse 7. There are three kind of powerful words that play off each other. The first is this one, rooted. And it's rizzo, actually. And it's firmly rooted. 
It's strengthened. It's only used here and one other place in the New Testament, and that's Ephesians 3, where Paul writes to the Ephesian believers, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, that it is, uh, it's, it's a picture of a tree, right? A tree that is planted. The only way the tree stays is if it has healthy roots, okay? You can't just take a tree and kind of set it on the ground and just let it go. The slightest breeze will topple it over. There's no way for that tree to survive. A tree survives when it has strong roots, whether they branch out, go deep, whatever. There's a healthy root system that keeps the tree, the plant, where it's supposed to be and provides nourishment. And, then, and then, so that's kind of an agricultural term that's used, that rizzo. But then this next one is built up. And this, this is epicodomio. And it's actually from two Greek words, and I promise you, I don't usually geek out this much on the Greek. I'm not doing it for the rest of the verses, but this, these things were kind of fun and cool for me, so just bear with me for a second. It's two Greek words here. It's the word doma, which is roof, and the word oikos, which is house. And so when you put these together, it's the completion of a house. It's what it takes to make a house usable. So has anyone in here ever actually done new construction on a house? You know, where you bought a house and, you know, you were there throughout the process. It wasn't already there. You didn't buy a pre, pre-done house. You said, okay, we're going to build a house. Anybody do that? A few of you. So what if you went through that whole process? You laid the foundation. You put the walls on, put doors in, windows in, you know, got the carpet laid, everything, and never bothered to put a roof on it. How useful would that house have been? Not at all. The only way the house is complete is when it has a roof, but it takes all this structure to get up to the roof because you can't also just slap a roof on the ground and say, look, it's a house. It takes both things, the rooting and the foundation, but it has to be finished and made useful. These are these two words from both an agricultural and a construction background that you're rooted, but you're also completed in what? It says in him, in Jesus. So, again, to walk in a manner worthy of Jesus truly being preeminent, of worthy, of supreme, I have to be rooted in him and built up, finished, complete. There's nothing more I can add to it. Jesus has done the work, and I can live in him accordingly. But then it also throws in this word, established. This is babeo, and it's a a word of enduring. It's about being durable. Not only do you have a foundation, not only are you complete in Christ, you've got your roof on, you are good to go, but you can stand the test of time. You can be weathered. You know, it's like the pyramids. They were built up, they're strong, and they have survived for thousands and thousands of years. They are durable. They are babeo. They they will last and stand the test of time. And that happens in two things. We see this in two ways. First of all, the rooted and built up is in him, is in Jesus. So the core of my being, the core of who I've been made to be is formed fully in Jesus. But then it says established in the faith. And the way this word faith is used in combination with the next word is this, just as you were taught. The idea of taught here, especially in the Greek language or in this culture, you didn't teach yourself something. If you were taught, it absolutely requires that there would be a teacher. So the idea of being established in the faith is that you were established, you were made durable by your connection to others and how they impacted your life for your faith. So the rooting, the the, the building up is happening in Jesus and the durability is being brought together through Jesus's family. If we are going to be those who walk worthy, we have to have a solid connection and foundation in him, and we must maintain a connection with God's family. We can't do it any other way. It can't be, well, I just have God, I don't need the church. We also can't go, I got the church, I don't really need to worry about me and God, the church will take care of that. Either one on its own is deficient. The way God has designed us is for both, to be in relationship with him and one another. And the result... What's that last word there? Thanksgiving. No, we're not talking about turkey and stuffing and yams, right? We're talking about having deep gratitude. It's an idea of contentment. I can abound with joy over the situation of my life, regardless of what's happening, 
because my foundation is in Jesus and my durability is rooted in my community. These are beautiful pictures that produces thanksgiving. So here, let me say it this way. I need, if I'm going to really follow Jesus, I need to take Jesus along with me and trust that he knows where, I'm, where he's going. So often we say, yes, I want Jesus with me. I want, I want Jesus to take the wheel. We're familiar with that phrase, right? Jesus take the wheel. Except we want to kind of reach over and hold on to it from the passenger seat. I'm not sure, Jesus. You, you, you don't want to get off here. All right, Jesus, you're getting a little close to that guardrail. I'm just going to pull you back over a little bit. We have to take Jesus with us and trust him that he knows where he's going. And that includes with his church. So often it's like, well, yeah, I, I'm part of a bunch of different uh, groups and communities on, uh, on social media, various places. And it's funny, when I hear people talking about church, it's, oh, yeah, my church is great. This is wonderful. I love this. And they'll go, but this church made a decision I didn't like, so... I decided to go somewhere else. I decided to stop going to church. So we go, I don't even know if God's real because this church did that. See, the problem is we have to trust that God works in me and in his church. We have to trust the process as well. When we think that connection to a church, to a faith community, is only always ever going to feel good and happy, we have a misconception about how humanity works because this can be hard to believe. At least one or two of you in this room is a sinner. I know. It's hard to believe. It's hard. But you know what? I'll go a step further. Every single one of you is a sinner, just like me. When you get a bunch of sinful people, even when they're redeemed, even when Christ has entered their lives and given them forgiveness and restoration, the vestiges of sin still hold on. And as a result, when sinful people are together in the same room, guess what happens? Sin happens. So we're going to bump into each other. Things aren't always going to feel great. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus Christ bought us. He paid for your sins and mine and has called us together to walk with one another in grace and mercy and forgiveness and humility and compassion as we got to be together in it. That doesn't mean that just because one of your elders, myself, someone, the church is infallible. I'm not saying that. There needs to be accountability. There, we, we have to have a standard, God's word that we live by. But we have to be willing to do the hard work and to not always get our way, because that is how that, that durability, right, the being established, that's how it happens, through time together working through these things. I need to trust Jesus to have the wheel, and I need to trust the other people he's invited along for the ride. That's what it means to follow after Jesus. If I'm going to follow Jesus, I need to do this. Well, let's look what else. That was just a couple verses in chapter 2. Let's keep going. Let's look at verse 8. Paul continues to talk. He says, see to it now that no one takes you captive. Has anyone in here ever been taken captive? Yeah, it's not a word we usually use. But the idea of captive is being captured. It's like a prisoner of war. It's where there's an enemy, and that enemy is restrained, yeah, their freedom is taken away, and they are placed into subjection to this power. So Paul's saying, see to it that nobody puts you in chains and makes you subservient to what? He says, by philosophy and empty deceit. These are the ideas of kind of hidden knowledge. In the first century world, there was a, a thought system at play called Gnosticism which itself is based off the Greek word gnosis, which is the word for knowledge. And these uh, kind of religions, whether they were actual religious or more like secular philosophies, they, they had this idea that there was secret hidden knowledge and only the enlightened had access to it. And they would extort this and those who had the knowledge would make others pay for it, would make others provide favors or uh, provide a political advantage in one way or another in order to gain access to it. It was, oh, that might be true, but I know the secret. And what Paul is saying is don't listen to him. There's not a hidden knowledge that you need beyond Jesus, because that's what was creeping in. 
People were coming into this early Christian community and saying, oh yeah, Jesus is a cool dude. We're down with Jesus. Yeah, I thought Jesus. But they were saying, There's, but if you really want to make God happy, yeah, Jesus is good, but I got something else. You just got to add a little bit here, and they would use like kind of um, persuasive words and, and quick talk. That's what these words, this philosophy and empty deceit refer to. It's trickery with words. And then he goes on to say, according to human tradition, using, well, this is what we always do. And so you don't have to necessarily do it the Jesus way because, well, that's good for Jesus. We're not saying he's bad, but this is how we do it. You say, don't be taken captive by these things or according to the elemental spirits of the world, which is a picture of the spiritual forces at play. That's the worldview in the early um, first century world, that, that there's this understanding that even though there's human actors, people, behind the scenes were the real authorities. These were the spiritual forces, and the Bible affirms that. That our struggle in this wor world, the Bible tells us, is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of darkness. One of the things that the Bible also affirms is that we have an enemy. And it's actually an enemy who is never actually named. All, all the names we have for this enemy, like Satan or Beelzebub, you know, you've heard those words before, right? Okay. None of them are names. They're all titles. They're all descriptions. They're not actually names. He is the unnamed enemy who is the deceiver. He is the unnamed enemy who's the father of lies. He's the unnamed enemy who works in the secret and in the dark and according to the spiritual stuff of this world, that that is who we struggle against. And Paul is saying, don't be taken captive by the thought that those are the things that should be in charge. See, these people who had these philosophies of the day, these people who had the secret knowledge would be, ah, yes, I can tell you the secrets of the spiritual world. Again, trying to say that there's this hidden knowledge that you needed, and you needed it plus Jesus. And how do I know this? Because look at the next words. See that no one takes you captive for any of these things and not according to Christ. At the bottom, at the root, at the foundation, the establishment, what you're built up in, all of it must be in Jesus. We have to understand who Jesus is and what he's done so that we will not be deluded by these philosophies or arguments which are deceptive. But again, I want to say this. We must use our brains. We should learn about our faith. We should learn... How do we answer some of these tough questions? Have you ever taken the time to really wrestle with some of those big questions, those big objections? If someone came up to you and said, yeah, I know you're one of those church people. I could never do that. Oh, well, why not? Well, how can God be good and there still be so much evil in the world? Now, you might be tempted to throw a nice little trite churchy answer at that. Yeah, I know that's kind of how I responded for such a long time. But the fact of the matter is that takes deep thought. That takes understanding who God is, not just the data about him, but the goodness of God that can only be known by knowing him and being with him and spending time with him, knowing his heart. Yeah, that's what you need if you're going to truly answer that question. But you have to think about it. You have to spend that time with him. You have to read stuff. You have to listen to other really smart people, people way smarter than me. I know it's a small bar, but still, people way smarter than me. Because it's important that we engage our brains because God is a God of truth. And those questions are important. And I would suggest that there are answers. There are responses to these big questions. We do not need to fear them. We do not need to run from them. Because quite frankly, if God cannot provide answers, if, if God's character and nature and revelation is not sufficient, if God is scared of these questions, I'd suggest he's not God. But what I know of reading his word, what I know having walked with him is that he is not scared of any question this world can throw at him. Now, we might not always be fully satisfied with the answers, but that's part of this being taught as part of this growing up, having roots deep and taking in that nutrients is getting to know him and getting to learn these answers. Because who is Jesus? 
What does it say here? For in him, in Jesus, verse 9, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. The divine took on flesh. Who is God? What is God like? What would God do? All of those questions are answered in the person of Jesus. Jesus is the exact image of who God is. That is why we can look at him and know, I should do what Jesus does. I should think what Jesus thinks. I, that's what I need to do. And that will give me the purpose and answers for this life because the whole fullness of deity dwells in him. And it says, for those of us who have followed him, the rest of here in verse 10, it says, and you have been filled in him. We have our fulfillment. We have our answers. We have our being in the one in whom the fullness of deity dwells. It is the transference of God's divine energy and essence into us through Christ. And we'll see because a word that we looked at um, last week comes back this week. Again, one of those kind of fun Greek words. But this Jesus who has filled us in whom the fullness of uh, deity dwells, he's the head of all rule and authority. One of the things we said last week, what we're going to come back to today, is if I follow Jesus, he does have to become my ultimate authority. Now, that doesn't mean he stands on high and as some taskmaster cracking a whip. That's not the picture of his rule and authority. He came as a servant. He came as one who was gentle and lowly, the Bible tells us. But he leads, and we must defer to him because he is the head of all rule and authority. All those elemental spirits of the world, they're in subjection to him. How do I know? How do I know with these empty uh, philosophies, empty deceit, human traditions, how do I know that that's that and that I follow Jesus who is the fullness of deity? I'd suggest this, that if I want to follow Jesus, I need to be so familiar with him that fakes don't fool me. In the world of uh, counterfeiting, you know, making fake money, those who are trained to detect counterfeits, do you know how they're trained? Yeah, they're, they're not given, okay, here's a fake bill, here's another fake bill, here's another fake bill, here's how they did it. You see, this was off a little bit here, and this one here was... They have their people study the real thing. They don't worry about trying to figure out everything that is wrong. They say, if you know what the real thing is, if you know what the genuine thing is, the fake one won't trick you. In this world, we need to be so familiar with Jesus that we are not fooled by the fakery. Because there are fake things. There are people and places, there are organizations, there's teachings out there that will claim the name of Jesus but who are not acting in his name, who are not part of his kingdom, who are not teaching his truth or operating according to his principles. And so that's why we need to be so familiar with Jesus that the, the fakes don't fool us. So what, is, what does some of this look like? Paul gives us an idea. In verse 11, he says, In him, in Jesus, you were circumcised. If at, by some chance at this point of your life you don't know what that word means, go ask your parents, they'll tell you. But it was a Jewish rite of setting apart. It was a way that the Jewish people marked their bodies physically that made them very different from anyone else out in the world. And this was a picture of saying that you are set apart, that you recognize that God is who God is and that you serve him. But he says, in Jesus, you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. It was no longer this outward thing that was done to you to try to mark you, but instead it was by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. What's that? Well, verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism. One of the things we believe at Grace Church, we believe in this thing called baptism. It's a, it's a rite, it's a ritual of being dunked underwater in a community setting to symbolize that as Jesus died and was born again, in Christ, we can die to our sins and be born back to life. And we do that as a public demonstration, a public declaration that we are set apart. That God has called us to be part of his family and I'm willing to claim that identity and step out to it. At the end of next month, uh, Memorial Day weekend, we're going to have the opportunity to have another baptism service time. It'll be at the end of our time together. We're going to be, it's going to be a Sunday where we're going to focus more on celebration in general. But on Memorial Day, we're doing a baptism. So if you are someone who's chosen to follow Jesus, 
She said, yes, I, I know who Jesus is. I've accepted his forgiveness, his payment of my debt. But you've never followed him in obedience of this symbol, what we as a, uh, a tribe of churches call an, uh, an ordinance, a way of uh, sacredly setting things apart to point us to the truth of, of who God is and what he's done. If you have never followed Jesus in baptism, I urge you to take advantage of this. Because it's a uniquely kind of uh, modern world, Western American thing that we kind of separate salvation and baptism. Baptism doesn't save you. You don't need baptism to get saved. It's not, it's not the same thing. But if you look at baptism in the Bible, and we see several places where this happens. People will say, I trust Jesus for my life, and immediately they're baptized. There's no, let's get ready. There's no, oh, hey, let's uh, take a few classes, or let me take a few years to get closer to Jesus. Every time in Scripture where we see someone baptized, it's connected with their very recent belief in Jesus. So I encourage you, if you've chosen to follow Jesus with your life, if you're trusting him with your eternity, I would ask that you be willing to trust in his call in our lives to get a little bit wet. And we're going to have that opportunity here at the end of May. All right? But that's what we've been, that's what this text says, that we've been marked in that way. We've been set apart. That this baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in what? So it's not the baptism that does it. It's through faith in what? The powerful working of God. This word, this is energia. It's the same word that we, we read in Colossians 1.29 last week, where it says, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. That the very energy I have access to is the work that he does. The very work that I do is energized by him, and that that powerful working, that's what I have faith in. Not in my ability. Not even in a symbol of baptism. I have faith in God's power because it is God who raised Jesus from the dead by this power. So if I want to live this life where Jesus gets to drive the, drive the car, where he gets to be the one that I take with me, that I, that I make much about. If I, if I want to live this way, I need to be beautifully different. I need to be like Jesus. I need to be set apart. Just like baptism is that outward symbol to declare to the world, I follow Jesus. I need with my life to be beautifully different. We shouldn't be those that the world looks at and says, man, they're just so weird. I don't want to be around them. That, that's not what the world should say. The world should look at those who have followed Jesus and be like, they're different. I don't get it. But I think it's good. People should look at the lives of those who follow Jesus and say, those are people that love hard. Those are people that give you the shirt off their back. Those are people who always make time for other people. Those are the people that, man, they're just nice to us. We need to be beautifully different living like Jesus. Jesus was the one in whom the fullness of deity dwelt bodily, and he calls us to imitate him. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, imitate me to his church, but not because Paul was awesome. He says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Our lives should reflect Jesus. We should be beautifully different like Jesus. We should live like Jesus. But if we keep reading into verse 13, he kind of tells us why. What's the point? He says, well, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, bringing that back in, he's saying, you weren't of value. You weren't set apart for God. In fact, you were dead in your trespasses, which is sin, wrongdoing. Here's the thing. How much do dead people do? Not much. I don't know about you, but I don't see a whole lot of work getting done in graveyards, right? You're dead, you're dead. You can't do anything. You have nothing to offer at that point. So when we were dead in our trespasses, you know what we had to offer God at that point? Nothing. There was nothing we had that could, we could go to God and say, hey, I'm worth it. You, sh you, should, you should give nice things to me. That we had nothing to offer because our sin was so deep. Our wrongdoing was so offensive because we weren't the loving creatures that God made us to be. But even though we were dead 
Even though we were uncircumcised in our flesh, that we were not set apart. It says, even though that, God made you alive together with him. And not just alive, it says, having forgiven us all our trespasses. If you've chosen to follow Christ, I need you to understand, you don't have a sin that God can't forgive. There's not something that's still clinging that you have to somehow atone for. Every sin is forgiven by Jesus. What we celebrated that East, uh, on Easter just recently, what we celebrated uh, at Easter time was something that happened 2,000 years ago where the, the darling of heaven, where God himself who took on flesh, who lived a perfect sinless life, died a death he didn't deserve, paid a price he didn't owe because he had never sinned, he died that death, was buried, and then he rose again by the power of God through, the, through his spirit. And as a result of that, he paid a debt he didn't owe and he can offer it to all of us. His perfect death can pay for every sin. So there is nothing in your life that makes you beyond the grace of God. There is no sin in your life that makes you too dirty to be really used by God. There is nothing that is stopping you from being whatever God wants you to be in him. It is not beyond your reach because it's not about your reach. It's his. He has reached it already. He has forgiven us all our sin by canceling the record of debt. That's what our sin bore. We had wronged God and we had wronged others. And in fact, we continue to do it. But his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, his sacrifice is so big that it canceled all of the debt that all of those sins will ever owe will ever accrue. It's canceled. It's wiped out. It's paid in full. That's what that word, if you remember, if you were with us on Easter, tetelestai, it is finished. It was stamped on, on financial documents when there was a debt. Stamped. It is finished. It is paid in full. That's what Jesus has done for us. He said that it stood against us with legal demands. It wasn't just, eh, well, God's not a big fan of it, but eh, you know, that's his opinion. It was legal. It was binding. And this it says that he set aside. He, we no longer have to pay it because he nailed it to the cross. He paid it. He finished it on the cross. So if I really want to follow Jesus, then I have to be overwhelmed by the good news of Jesus. I told you guys I hoot and holler when it comes to Jesus. I get excited by this word gospel, right? What does gospel mean, church? Good news. good news. It is good. It is great. It should get us excited. I need to be overwhelmed because if I'm underwhelmed by the gospel, it means I'm underwhelmed by Jesus. If I'm underwhelmed by the gospel, if I'm underwhelmed by Jesus, then we have to question, do I really know him? Because he is the perfect son of God. He is all of divinity. Come take on flesh for us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. If I'm underwhelmed by Jesus, I have to under check myself if I even know him at all. If it's just this nice little fact to know, I would suggest you need to get to know Jesus a little bit better. But we have one more verse for this morning, just one. And here's what Paul says. Who is this Jesus? What all has he done? Well, he has disarmed the rulers and authorities, all those spiritual things that these people were saying, there was secret knowledge, all the, the stuff that's in the background that we're supposed to fight against. Jesus disarmed them. He took their weapons away. He spayed and neutered them. They have no more vitality. They have no more ability to actually harm us. He put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. This open shame and triumphing, it's a picture of what during the, the, the Roman Empire would do with their enemies. They would lead the enemies in front of them, shackled and chained. It's playing back on that word captive that we already looked at. They would lead them in front of the, the, the victorious uh, uh, victors coming in, and they would lead in front, and they were shamed. They were often naked. 
they were ridiculed and mocked to say, we have dominion over them. This is the complete dominion that Jesus achieved over all the spiritual forces of darkness against everything that would oppose God, everything that we might otherwise fear or be enslaved to, we don't have to fear because Jesus disarmed them. He took all the bullets out of their guns. They cannot hurt us. He says he did this all in Jesus. So if this is who Jesus is, if this is what Jesus has done, if he truly is preeminent and supreme and the exact image of the almighty deity fully, fully in bod bodily form dwelt, then I would suggest that I need to change my allegiances and my worship. If Jesus is who he says he is, I don't get to just go on with my life like nothing has happened. Jesus is who he said he is. Jesus did what he said he did. So that changes everything. And it comes back to this exactly where we ended last week. And that is this. Following Jesus means I'm no longer the ultimate authority in my life. Now, our worship team is going to come up. We're going to, we're going to wrap up with, with one song yet today. And we've got some great things happening. We've got our discovery track with Christian. He's going to be able to walk you through maybe what's next for you in your walk with Jesus or your connection with the church. We're going to have an opportunity to have this meeting where we, we talk about what we're doing as a church to bless our community because God has put us here for the good of the city in which he's planted us. We learn that from Jeremiah 29 where, where God has placed us here. He's, he's purposeful in what he's done. And just as he saved us, he's called us to live that salvation out in the communities that he's planted us. We're going to talk about how we're going to do that as a church family. The only way that makes sense is if I'm not the boss. Because you know what? There are a lot of things that if I were in charge, I wouldn't do. I'm just going to be honest. There are things that following Jesus entails that I am not naturally inclined towards. I can be not nice. It's hard to believe. All of you are all naturally just super nice, okay? I get that. But me? It's easy to become frustrated with someone and then let them know why they've made me frustrated. It's easy for me to insist that my opinion matters more than everyone else's in this world. It's easy for me to make sure that I take care of me first. And maybe if someone else earns it, I give them something nice with what's left over. Those are the things that are easy, that are natural. And I would suggest that for most of us, that's our easy natural. We think about ourselves first. But Jesus says that we are to deny ourselves daily, take up our cross and follow him, which means this world transfers from being what's most important. This world, meaning these systems, these cultures, the, the idea that everybody takes care of themselves first, that becomes subservient to the one who actually served everyone. Jesus is in the work of putting things back together, of restoring and redeeming what humanity broke. And he says, if you, if you are part of my family, you will participate in that ministry. It's called the ministry of reconciliation. You read about that in 2 Corinthians. We are called to be ambassadors for Christ for the sake of declaring Jesus in this world and living Jesus in this world. And that's what we're invited to do. That's why we're doing this fun day in the park because the people who make up Ephrata bear the image of God. And we do it on a Sunday because most likely those who are running around a park at 10 a.m. on a Sunday aren't connected to a church. They're the ones who need the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we will let them know that they matter. We will pour into them and say, God loves you. Because God loves us so we can love him and God loves us so we can love others.